Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sean Sullivan, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on the Universal Wireless Flight Sensor Systems Technology. Our presenter today is Matt Walderson. Matt is a research and development engineer at NASA's Neil A. Armstrong Flight Research Center. After receiving a BS in electrical engineering from Purdue University in 2013, he worked as a design and research engineer within Orbital ATK's, now Northrop Rob Grumman, Propulsion, Propulsion System Division. While at Orbital ATK, his primary areas of focus included flight instrumentation, avionics, and electrical ground support systems for the Space Launch System Solid Rocket Boosters and the Orion Spacecraft Launch Abort System. He was also an integral member of various research and development teams at Orbital ATK, conducting research into advanced avionic and instrumentation systems. In December 2015, he began his career at NASA, where he works as a researcher in the Flight Instrumentation and System Integration Branch. In his current position, he has been part of the Orion AA-2 instrumentation team and the X-59 Low Boom Flight Demonstrator instrumentation team, and is currently the Deputy Flight Systems Lead for the F-15D supersonic research testbed. Today, we will focus on the technology developed to incorporate wireless sensor technology in aerospace vehicles without adding the complexity and tonnage normally associated with physically modifying existing avionics a single universal wireless access point or gateway that can communicate between existing onboard systems and any subscribed wireless device. Following today's presentation on the wireless flight sensor system, I will give a short presentation on how NASA licenses technology to outside organizations. Now, before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you, Matt. All right. All right. Hey, um, so really quickly, my name is Matt Walderson. Uh, thank you, Sean, for introducing me. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, so what problem are we trying to solve? Um, you know, why do we need wireless sensing um, on, on an aircraft? Um, and it turns out that cables are really, really heavy. Um, so this is um, uh, the, some figures I got off the New York Times. Um, but the Airbus A380 has over 100, approximately 100,000 individual wires, which accumulatively add up to 300 miles in total length and 12,500 pounds in total weight, which is pretty ridiculous if you think about it. Like I think an elephant weighs like 2,000 pounds or something like that. So that's roughly six elephants just in wire hanging out on an airplane every time it takes off. So there, you know, there's the weight savings, but a lot of things that people don't realize is they're also really difficult to integrate. Um, you need a team of engineers like me that are designing where to put it, where to route it through. You need mechanical designers. That means that you've got drawings. That means you've got you know fleets of technicians that are trying to route things through. There's procurement. Um, and all of this is non-recurring. So there's a um, not only a loss to payload, but there's also, um, you know, it's expensive to actually design into your system, all of which is non-recurring. So you don't get any return off of investment basically after you do that. So if wires are such a big issue, you know, why don't we have wireless avionic systems? Um, you know, and when I first started here, that was something that we really kind of took a critical look at. Um, the most obvious reason, um, which it sounds kind of silly when you think about it, but it's actually a pretty big, uh, you know, big issue is that current avionic systems don't support wireless technology. Um, there's a high cost in replacing pre-existing avionic systems, which basically means once you wire something up and once you've designed it, you need to pay those same designers to unintegrate the system that you already have. So wires, pre-existing wired systems aren't just gonna magically disappear. Um, also, there's a lot of regulatory compliance uh, complexities, which means, you know, we've got the uh, FAA in the US, but, you know, airplanes fly over the world. So you may have regulations in one part of the world that are different than somewhere else. Um, also with the emergence of um, uh, portable electronic devices like your cell phones and your laptops, um, the FAA, their policy has, you know, evolved over time. So at the time when I put this presentation together, I think it had evolved five times since 2000. 
Um, you know, it used to be that you couldn't use anything wireless and now it's okay, you know, just wait until you get to altitude and you can use your phones and everything else. Um, so that's evolved over time. Um, the other, another major barrier to wireless avionics is obsolescence risk, right? So why would um, I design a flight system that can incorporate newer or alternative wireless technology several years from now? And I think that this graph does a good job of kind of just showing how quickly things are advancing. So if you were to design, um, you know, a wireless system that utilizes Wi-Fi in 2009, you know, your data rate is roughly, you know, 450, you know, megabits per second. And then three years later, you know, it's already gone up, you know, by a factor of three. So you could have had the latest and greatest cutting edge technology back in 2009, but within three years, which is well within the lifespan of the vehicle, you've already got a system that's way obsolete. Um, the other major barrier that we saw to wireless avionics is there really isn't a one size fits all solution. Um, so each uh, wireless communication method has its pros and cons. Um, so for example, Wi-Fi, which is 802.11 is great for high bandwidth applications. You can get a lot of data through really quickly, but it also utilizes a lot of power where take uh, like Bluetooth or RFID, super low power. In fact, RFID is basically zero power. Um, but you can't get the transmission uh, rates that you need um, with that technology. So, you know, some applications, Wi-Fi is probably a little bit better. Some applications, Bluetooth, RFID would be a little bit better. So the optimal wireless avionics system needs to be heterogeneous. Um, so one thing I want to point out when I'm talking about barriers to wireless technology, um, there are other barriers, you know, um, like in certain environments, you know, they're shadowing. Um, reflections, you can't transmit through metal, there's time synchronization. Um, but the point of this, you know, technology that we're working on is really the avionics interface to incorporate these systems. So with that in mind, um, what are our goals and objectives? You know, what are we trying to solve? So we wanted to design an avionics interface that lessens the challenge of integrating new wireless systems. So that goes into the whole obsolescence risk thing. Um, and it also, you know, ties into, um, you know, easing the integration risk. Um, so we wanted to design a wireless avionics interface that could rapidly incorporate new wireless technology. Um, so we want to be able to choose the right wireless technology for the right application, reduce obsolescent risk again. Um, we wanted to design a interface that was implementation agnostic. So, you know, right now I'm working on an F-15. That's the uh, supersonic research test bed. Not, if I designed this wireless system that could only work on an F-15, it, it's not really gonna do a whole much, a whole bunch. Um, and we also wanted to design, and this is one of the things that I've come to realize more and more, is we wanted an avionics interface that provided a layer of abstraction. So basically what that means is you've got a lot of really smart wireless communication RF engineers out there. Um, but not all of them know a whole bunch about, you know, integration, like avionics integration and flight instrumentation and that sort of thing. And then conversely, you've got a lot of people who know a lot about instrumentation and avionics, but they really don't know how to design wireless systems. So we want to achieve something called technological convergence, where we've got, you know, one field that's rapidly advancing and we want to be able to merge those innovations into an avionics platform. And in order to do so, you need to design it. So if you're a wireless designer, you don't really need to worry about how the data is being used and what's you know happening there. You wanna be able to just have two separate systems where you're like, okay, it goes to this point and you can communicate and there's no issues. So to give you an overview of our current work is we're currently designing a wireless flight system, a wireless flight sensor system that leverages software defined radio technology. Um, and I'll go into detail on what that is um, in some following slides, but basically the benefit of a software defined radio is that you can um, incorporate new wireless capability um, entirely through software modifications. So this addresses, um, you know, the issue where it's like, okay, if you had a wireless interface, every single time a new technology comes out, you need to do, uh, install a new interface for it to work. Um, so what's great about this is that gives us the ability to rapidly incorporate, you know, uh, other people who are doing flight test experiments with wireless avionics without needing to modify our pre-existing avionics architecture over and over again every single time a new experiment comes out. Um, so again, 
the point of this technology really isn't um, to introduce new, you know, wireless protocols or modulation techniques or anything like that, but it really is to uh, facilitate the technology and the development and the work of others. So what is software-defined radio? Um, I think this, uh, this image on the right does a good job of describing that. So if you look at like all the different things, you've got multiplexers, modems, digital tuners, all this stuff, this, those are the different uh, parts that go into wireless communication. Now, if you look at the graph um, that says hardware radio, you can see what amount of all the things that are required in um, wireless communication, all of this is being implemented on designated hardware. So, you know, if you wanted to use a Wi-Fi uh, communication, you would need a Wi-Fi chip. Uh, Bluetooth would need a Bluetooth chip. Um, but with software-defined radio, it takes all these things that are traditionally done in hardware and it implements them in software. Um, so with that, we're able to, you know, communicate with a wide uh, variety of frequencies. Um, and we use the phrase, um, you know, adding wireless capability at the speed of software. Um, and this is why, is because we don't need to add new hardware every time we want to include a new wireless te uh, technology. Um, so again, it's reprogrammable to accommodate a wide variety of uh, current and future protocols that goes into the obsolescence risk issue. Um, and it's ideal, at least, you know, from our center's perspective, uh, for testing and developing new wireless sensor technology. So to kind of really hit this home, I, I want to propose um, a, use, uh, a use case scenario. So this is if we wanted to install some type of wireless thing on an airplane right now, and this is how it would basically go if we didn't use software refine radio. So let's say we've got the system that uses uh, wireless sensors and they communicate over Wi-Fi. Um, and then some new cutting edge sensor technology, but it uses Bluetooth comes out. And we really want this Bluetooth technology on our airplane. So if we wanted to do that, we'd have to you know, modify the pre-existing Wi-Fi system to incorporate both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, which even though, yeah, we're leveraging wireless technology, we're still running into that reoccurring engineering cost. Uh, you need engineers to design and route power to that new access point. Um, you need to flight certify it. And even though you're saving wire, you're still inheriting a large amount of integration cost. So let's look at the same situation though with software-defined radio. So again, you've got this Wi-Fi sensor system on your airplane and this new cutting edge, awesome Bluetooth technology comes out. Well, at first you're kind of in the same situation where you don't have a Bluetooth com uh, compatible interface, uh, but with software-defined radio, all you need to do is upload the new Bluetooth communication protocol onto this access point. So you don't need to go through and remodify, integrate new interfaces, you know, check that out, test that out. So you're able, again, to integrate new capability all through the speed of software rather than the speed of hardware. So how this architecture works, um, we utilize something called a publish subscribe architecture um, where um, publishers are things providing information, subscribers um, in this image, I call them flight computers, but it really could be anything. Um, I know that um, people doing flight critical avionics, you know, they're like, okay, hold on, you know, we're not quite ready for that yet. But if you're doing um, low criticality flight test instrumentation, um, developmental flight instrumentation, um, or if you just want to even use it for things like, um, you know, the button you press when you want to want to call a flight attendant over, or like smoke alarms and stuff like that. Um, so basically. Um, in this architecture, the software-defined radio access point acts as a broker, which is basically something that takes information in and then gives it out. So you've got the publishers, which are the wireless sensors, which are things, think of it like a newspaper, that are providing data to this access point. They don't know what it's being used for, um, where it's going. All they care about is, okay, I need to provide this data to this access point at this time. And then before a flight, you've got the uh, subscribers, which are things that are requesting information. So what the sus uh, subscribers do is they go to this access point, they're like, hey, I need this information at this time. So there's no direct connection between wireless sensor and the flight system. The, both of them are only communicating to this one access point and there's an air gap between the two. And the software-defined radio, uh, again, as this broker takes the information in and it's like, okay, I'm getting this stuff from these sensors. 
and it now needs to go to these points at these points in times. So you don't need to worry about routing through the flight network or doing anything like that. So if you look at this architecture, um, you know, so what are the advantages of doing so? So, okay, we want to eliminate the need to constantly integrate new hardware. And the software-defined radio as a universal access point really solves that problem because all you need to do is, again, modify the software, which makes it, you know, rapidly reconfigurable. Again, through the speed of software, you don't need to worry about installing and integrating new hardware interfaces. Um, it's implementation agnostic. Um, the access point really just serves as a courier of information um, on a pre-existing vehicle network. So you can put that on, you know, an airplane, but it can also go onto like a car or in a factory um, or in agriculture. Um, and it provides this layer of abstraction that we were looking for. Because again, if you're developing a wireless sensor, all you need to worry about is communicating to this access point. You don't need to know how the data is being used, how it's being formatted, where is it going, um, and vice versa. You know, so you just link up your, you know, quote unquote flight computers to this one access point. And you don't need to change it, you know, how that system works every single time you want to incorporate a new wireless technology. All you need to do is subscribe to that information. Um, the other advantage, and this is one of the cool things, um, a lot of people look at this and they're like, okay, the software sounds really great, but I don't know how to design a software-defined radio. Um, but what's awesome about that is this hardware platform already exists. So this isn't a new technology. We're just repurposing it. Um, they're used um, for electronic warfare, um, and they're just used for, you know, wireless research in general. Um, when we get into the, you know, current state of the technology, I've got a software-defined radio at my desk right now. Um, so there's no, uh, again, another benefit, it goes, one of the questions I get a lot is cybersecurity. And yeah, there's no hack-proof system. I mean, you can always, you know, flood the RF spectrum so nothing can communicate. Um, people have brought up, oh, well, what do we need to encrypt the data? And for me, that's really up to the user. Um, but it is intrinsically safe from a vehicle standpoint in the sense that the only way um, someone would be able to access the information being provided and know, like knowing how it's used is if they somehow got into the vehicle network and subscribed to it. Um, this becomes a little bit more of a problem when you get into things like agriculture um, and systems where it's easier to um, have access to what you're subscribing to. Um, that's referred to a man in the middle attack. Um, but again, you do have this air gap where you don't have anything, the ability um, as a, you know, external wireless device to communicate directly with something on your vehicle network. Um, and it's also a modular architecture in the sense that, you know, you upload new apps or um, what have you. And that gives you the ability to integrate new uh, wireless communication capability. So, um, yeah, you know, like we're NASA, um, and I talk about how, um, you know, cable weight is, you know, something we are, we're trying to cut down on, you know, um, but this isn't limited to the aerospace and defense. Um, basically, anywhere there's a need uh, to reduce wiring or wiring isn't practical and wireless sensing is something that, you know, would work, uh, this architecture would fit. Um, so, again, I mean, manufacturing and industrial facilities, you know, think about all the wiring and all the stuff you need to put into an assembly line. Um, automobiles, infrastructure is a big one. Um, agriculture, you can't route, you know, wires into a field, you know, and, and have that, you know, be practical. Um, logistics and distribution facilities, smart homes. Um, again, anywhere there's a need for wireless sensing, uh, this concept um, could be put to use. So um, a lot of times someone will come up with an idea and they're like, oh, yeah, it's just this is a cool thing. Um, you know, so it's cool. Therefore, you can go and sell it. Um, where in this case, again, it's really contingent upon incorporating the technologies of others. So we wanted to take a moment and talk about the business models that someone who would be interested in licensing this technology could utilize. Um, so the first obvious one, right, is a marketplace business model. Um, growing up, and I, I think that this analogy fits, to me, the, what made a smartphone a smartphone, um, it wasn't the touch screen, it wasn't, you know, like the camera, it, it was the app store. Because if you think about it, before smartphones, 
if you wanted a phone that did a specific thing, you know, you would buy a camera phone or an MP3 player phone. Um, one of my friends growing up wanted an ESPN phone really bad because it would just text him the scores of, you know, like the Cubs and the Bears and everything. Um, and then, you know, so you had a hardware centric solution and you didn't have the, like, if you wanted a certain capability, you would need to buy specific hardware in order to get that capability. And then the smartphone comes out and it's got this modular architecture where it could be completely user definable. And they use this marketplace business model where it actually made it more profitable by making it user definable and making your customer happier. Um, so in this case, yeah, you know, if you've got a universal platform that um, can basically communicate with any wireless device. So you can have the software modules being developed by third parties and then resell that in a marketplace. You can sell wireless sensors in a marketplace. Um, so, uh, I, I think a marketplace business model would be really applicable here. And um, the other one is uh, the razor and blades business model. So um, the definition of that, right, is one item is sold at a premium in order to increase the sales of a complimentary good or service. Um, so when I first heard about this, I was actually a kid. Um, so my dad uh, was an investment uh, banker when I was growing up and he was telling me a story how um, someone came up to him and they were trying to sell oil that you could put on to like extend the life of razor blades. And he mentioned that that was like the holy grail of like a business model. Um, and my dad asked him, you know, well, how do I know it, it, you know, it just isn't baby oil. And then the guy got super mad and left and it turned out it was baby oil. Um, but it always kind of stru uh, stuck with me, you know, why is extending the life of razor blades a big deal? Um, but the origin of this business model, it starts, it started when uh, razor companies like Gillette um, would give away razors for free. And that seems like a weird way to make money, you know, if you're giving away your razors for free. And it turns out if people liked them, the margins were so high on replacement blades that they would make back the money that they made, um, you know, just even though they were giving away their initial product for free. Um, and that's actually something that's seen um, in other industries as well. Um, it's my understanding that uh, gaming consoles, they actually lose money every time they sell a console. And that's because if you think about it, okay, you lose a hundred bucks, but then you can't do anything with the gaming console unless you, you know, either download apps or you buy a video game. And the margins on the apps and the video games are so high that they make their money back, you know, instantly. So, you know, this gateway by itself it needs other products, complementary goods and service and uh, services in order to be useful. Um, so if you're looking to, you know, use this marketplace, expand that out, um, you've got a product that in the act of having someone buying it automatically implies, uh, will automatically result in the sales of complementary goods and services. Um, and then the final one is, uh, you know, a subscription service. So anywhere there's a software architecture that involves things like apps, um, you know, you can charge uh, for someone to, you know, have access to this. Um, you can have subscriptions to, you know, the wireless communication modules, um, as well as just the architecture in general. So the current status of it, um, the crux of the technology is having this one piece of hardware that can be reprogrammed to communicate with a, wire, a variety of wireless devices. Um, so that includes not only dissimilar protocols, but also different communication frequencies. So we were able to show in the lab, yeah, you can absolutely have multiple wireless devices and with minimal software up, uh, updates, um, or modifications, you can easily reprogram it in a modular way to communicate with a wire, uh, variety of devices. Um, so with that said, an initial version of the software uh, with this published subscriber architecture and everything um, is in development. Um, but we're, you know, kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because on one hand, it, it goes back to what business model you want to adopt. So if you want a subscription service, if NASA is going to be developing software, you know, we're not a business. Um, so we're not going to include, you know, uh, a subscription service in our initial version of the software. Um, you know, there's also, okay, well, what uh, industry do you want to apply, you know, have it uh, work with? You know, if you want to go uh, the aerospace route, you know, yeah, like, okay, you're designing it for a ruggedized platform, you know, that's aerospace approved. Well, if you're trying to do this for agriculture, I mean, then that's kind of overkill. 
and that's you know a pretty expensive access point. Um, and since the architecture itself is dependent on what hardware you use, we, we we're realizing that okay, you know, even if we did have you know this beta version available, ultimately we couldn't just give it to someone and have them move forward and you know instantly put it to use. Um, without incorporating their business model. So what the ideal situation for us is that we're able to license this um, and basically buy it from whoever decides to manufacture it. So again, it depends on what software defined radio is being used, what type of business model you want to incorporate. Um, you know, is there going to be an app store interface that we need to work with? Um, all that stuff is beyond the scope of the NASA development project. Um, so we'd like uh, to, you know, give that to you guys basically. So um, with all that said, um, that's uh, the presentation. So are there any uh, questions, discussions we'd like to have or? Well, thanks, Matt. Real quick before we get into uh, the Q&A, uh, I'm going to go over uh, a couple of slides on how businesses can partner with NASA through technology licenses. So if you can go ahead and just go to the next slide for me. So as with the technologies that we discussed today, uh, NASA has approximately 1,200 other technologies in a variety of categories available for licensing. Uh, these technologies are listed on our NASA Technology Transfer Portal at technology.nasa.gov. Additionally, NASA has hundreds of downloadable software programs available for use through our NASA software catalog at software.nasa.gov. New technologies and software are added throughout the year across the agency, providing the opportunity to a variety of industries to access NASA-developed technology. Next slide, please. So each on the tech transfer portal, the technology.nest.gov website, each technology has a page that provides an overview and has a link to take you directly to our automated license application process. Once an application has been received, the licensing manager will review the application and reach out to you to discuss next steps. So for this particular technology, you can see the uh, web link that's there at the bottom uh, where you can go in. There's also a, a button that allows you to just ask questions if you don't want to get directly into the licensing um, application process. Next slide, please. All right. So it, additionally, there's a lot of other resources and information about our program, how it works on the website. Um, if you want to learn more about the technology licensing process, you can go to uh, technology.nasa.gov slash license. Um, but if you have any specific questions, especially about this technology or the presentation that you saw today, please uh, contact the Tech Transfer Office at uh, NASA Armstrong using the email address that's right there on the left side of the screen. Once again, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, and hopefully we'll see you at another upcoming NASA Technology Transfer webinar. You all have a great day.